And so that's where we'll pick up the last few verses of Galatians chapter 3 tonight as we return to our study free at last, an expository look into the book of Galatians. I would remind you that Galatians is written to a group of Christians who had strayed away from the grace way. They had started, properly so, under the teaching of the Apostle Paul who had established the church there with an emphasis on grace, but slowly they had turned toward rules-keeping. And Paul was now addressed, and it was because of a group of Judaizers who were teaching that they had to become Jews as well as Christians if they wanted to be in the body of Christ. And so Paul wrote this entire letter to them, and the entire letter is under the theme of being free. Free from rules, free from regulations. The rules and regulations of the Old Testament. I realize that it's sometime in this lesson series, you probably have thought, he sounds like he's against rules. I'm not against rules. I'm not against regulations. I think we have to have laws and rules. We're all exhibiting or proving one law right now, and that is the law of gravity. If we didn't have it, we'd all be floating around somewhere up here. I'm all for laws. I really am. I'm all for rules. I'm glad there are speed limits. I don't always observe them, but I'm glad they're there. And I, I try when I think about it, you know. I, I had a friend who was a, a state trooper in Tennessee years ago. I remember him telling me one time, one of his favorite stories is when he pulled over a sweet little old lady and he said, ma'am, did you know you were going 65 miles an hour? And she said, that's ridiculous. I haven't even been gone an hour. You'll get that later. Some of you will. The smart people all laughed. The antisocial people didn't. But uh, he said he laughed so hard that he just gave her a warning. He didn't, even, <laughs> he didn't even write her a ticket, even though she was going about 20 miles over the speed limit. Mahatma Gandhi, the most influential figure in the second most populous nation on earth, India. He's known as the father of modern India, but his story, very interesting as it relates to Christianity. He was a brilliant guy, and he really loved to study and search for the truth. In 1891, after graduating from law school in London, he moved to South Africa to practice law. And you remember the racial system of apartheid was strictly observed in South Africa. But he had been studying the Bible along with other religious texts, and he loved the Sermon on the Mount, and he was fascinated by the teachings of Jesus. And so one day he decided to visit a church in South Africa, and his skin was light brown. And when he entered the church, a South African man said to him with a belligerent tone, where do you think you're going, Kafir? And Kafir was a racial slur like one we're familiar with in our country. And God, he said, well, I'd like to attend worship here. And he said, there's no room for kafirs here. Get out of here or I'll have some of my men throw you down the steps. And Gandhi left and never seriously considered Christianity again. And I'm sure that was part of the reasoning behind his famous quote, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I've been seeing that quote for 40 years or more. But every time I see it, I think about what if his experience had been different? What if he hadn't been called by a slur and instead he had been greeted warmly and treated kindly? treated like Christ wants Christians to treat other people. I just wonder what kind of an impact that might have had on India. We'll never know. Ultimately, Gandhi rejected Christ because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. But that's not just true in South Africa or during South Africa during apartheid. It's also true everywhere when people for any reason 
discriminate against another group of people. And we're going to see that in our text very plainly tonight. We've made our way to verse 26, which reads, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. Like putting on new clothes. And then Paul addresses three specific areas of distinctions among people. And I'm so glad that he did. He said there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Wow. Now remember, earlier in chapter 3, Paul recounted an incident that happened at the church in Antioch. The church in Antioch had both Jews and Gentiles. I personally believe that's why they were called Christians first in Antioch, because they were the first integrated church. And, and Peter had been just fine with that, as he should have been. Peter was the one whom God really revealed in Acts chapter 10 that there's no separation in people. And Peter was eating pork just like everybody else until his buddies from Jerusalem came and said, what are you doing? And Peter then was frankly two-faced rather than graced. He got up and left the table and Paul rebuked him and confronted him to the face. And he spends the rest of this letter reminding the Christians in the church at Galatia of who they are and why they are who they are. Now, in verse 26, he uses the phrase, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, that's an interesting term that he uses there, in Christ Jesus. Because in his 11 epistles or letters, he used that phrase 83 times. Must be important. Must be important to be in Christ Jesus. In baptism, according to verse 26 puts us into that relationship with Christ where we are then clothed, which speaks of our identification with Christ. When we are clothed with Christ, we show whose team we're on. Um, the last two years, we have held here a Jersey Sunday on, on Super Bowl Sunday. And we've asked you to wear the jersey of your favorite sports team, no matter who it is. And it's always interesting because you tell where somebody's allegiance is by what shirt they're wearing. Your clothing identifies a part of you in that instance. Paul uses this same analogy to talk about us as Christians. He says your clothing identifies who you belong to. And the picture he paints here is that in Christ, we are a favored child, a son. Remember, in those times, a daughter didn't receive any inheritance in the family. That's why Paul uses this male child image. Whether you are male or female now, he says, as a follower of Jesus, you have the full rights of a son. You are the heir of Abraham. In many other places, the Bible uses the term children of God. And for instance, in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, it says that God is the father of sons and daughters. Now, contrary to popular belief, everyone on the planet is not a child of God. Everybody on the planet is created by God. But everybody on the planet is not a child of God. The Bible speaks very clearly. You can't, if you're a Bible believer, you cannot believe that. The Bible speaks very clearly of two fathers. 
Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. Only those who belong to Jesus have the heavenly Father. Then he said that to those who were unbelievers, you belong to your father, the devil. You are either a part of the family of God, with God as your father, or you're a part of a family with Satan as your father. Unbelievers. And that's what the Bible simply teaches. Parents, have you noticed the difference in your child and other children? When we go to an event where our kids are participating, we really mostly watch our kids. Sometimes we don't even know the names of the other kids. And any good dad isn't critical, he's proud. Your kid may be on the sidelines or on the bench instead of on the field or on the court, but you're still going to be watching them. There can be 30 little girls in the dance recital, but your eyes are centered on the one that is yours, that you are a parent of. We go to almost all of our two grandchildren's Little League games, and I... I have my phone with me, and when Taylor goes to bat or when Harrison goes to bat, I pull out my phone and I record their at bat. I don't record anybody else's at bat. They're my child. They're related to me. And we want to tell everybody, that's my boy or that's my girl or that's my grandson or that's my granddaughter, and that's how the Heavenly Father watches over us when we are in His family. He watches over us with love and compassion. Now, some theologians have called Galatians 3.28 the Christian Magna Carta, where the Bible says there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I think Paul probably chose those three categories as an intentional slap in the face of these Judaizers, these Jews who were demanding that people become Jews as well as become Christians because they were proud of their religion, their race, their standing, and even their sex. Every morning a good Jewish man would pray, God, I thank you that you did not make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And so understand this now if you don't understand anything else. When Paul spoke these words, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, primarily to Jewish Christians. There were Gentiles in the church, but primarily to Jewish Christians. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. He was basically insulting the very belief of the Jewish men who prayed that prayer every morning. Because a, a daughter didn't have rights. Only the son did. Slaves had no rights. Only the free did. Jews, for the most part, in general, hated Gentiles. When he spoke these words, I don't know how I can tell you how revolutionary that would be. I mean, the Torah was the centerpiece of Israel's relationship and communion with God. It had been commanded all through Moses' teachings, and according to the story of the Old Testament, it did not appear to have any expiration date. The people of God felt like they were tied to the Torah for all time. And here Paul comes on the scene and contends that Jesus made Gentiles every bit as much members of the people of God as Israelites had been. What? <laughs> what? So here's the issue that came up almost instantly. Since Gentiles are now welcome as full members in Israel's story, does that mean that they are also supposed to keep the Torah? That's what they were fighting about. That's what the Judaizer teachers were teaching in the church at Galatia. 
In other words, did Gentiles have to convert to Judaism in order to be followers of the Jewish Messiah? And Paul says, no. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. They're equal. They are all one in Christ Jesus. And what he's doing there at the same time is saying that Jesus was putting an end to the requirement of Torah keeping, not only for Jew, Gentiles, but also for Jews. Because if the Gentiles didn't have to do it, neither did the Jews. And that was unthinkable. And these Jews were understandably upset with Paul. And, and it's, it's not hard to put ourselves in their place and see why. I mean, even though Jesus himself was a surprise ending as the Messiah, Jewish followers of Jesus did not for one moment think that that meant laying aside Torah. And so Paul is in effect saying, well, Torah was never really central to God. It was only a temporary, it was only a placekeeper. And he's going to say that later in Galatians it was only a placekeeper for the reality of what was to come. And that, that just about gave them a nervous breakdown. And, and I don't think that should surprise us in any sense. So imagine, imagine this Sunday morning, if I came in here and I said to the congregation that was assembled, you know what? Joseph Smith was right. Brigham Young was right. We should all no longer follow just the New Testament because they follow partly the New Testament. We should also follow the teachings of Joseph Smith and what the high council out in uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, says. Well, I'd be hauled away and a search committee would be formed faster than you could say abracadabra. That, in a sense, was what is happening here. Lay aside the Torah for good, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Wow. Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. As Islam continues to spread around the world, we need to be aware of some of its beliefs. Let's talk about that as it relates to male and female. Uh, I was preaching for a week in Detroit, Michigan about three or four years ago, and I was taken by the uh, bones to Dearborn, Michigan. I'd never seen anything like it, honestly. I see some people from Michigan back there shaking their head already. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd heard about Dearborn, Michigan. And I'd heard how it was basically its own little Muslim enclave in the United States with its own mayor, its own city council. You can't be elected there unless you're a Muslim. And it's just, it was unbelievable, like nothing I'd ever seen. But here's what was fascinating to me. All the men were free. No face coverings, no special clothing. All the women, all the women, or miles and miles that you would see. Dressed totally in black with nothing but an eye opening. And I should have been, shouldn't have been surprised, but I was because their sacred writing says men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend from their wealth. So righteous women are devoutly obedient, guarding in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them that if they persist, forsake them in bed and finally strike them. If you don't think there's a major difference in the Muslim teaching in the Muslim world between male and female, which this passage suggests, you are simply deceived and not paying attention. A major difference between Christianity and that world religion is the way it views 
women. In every culture, in every religion, including Christianity, the human tendency has to build walls between groups of people. And the message is, don't you cross my wall and I won't cross your wall. But Jesus didn't come to build walls. The New Testament makes it very clear he came to tear down those kinds of walls. Male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. Ephesians, the same author, says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Jesus isn't saying there aren't differences between people. Yes, we may have different colored skin, different pigments. We might have different jobs. We might have different positions of leadership. And there are differences between men and women. But he is saying that in Christ, we're all the same. There are only two categories that really matter in the world. Are you in Christ or are you not? So I love what he does here. Paul specifically breaks down three of these walls of hostility that he himself had talked about. He bridges racial division. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, the false teachers in Galatia were telling the Gentile Christians they had to become Jews before they could become Christians. And Paul struck back at that and said, grace is for every race. It doesn't matter whether you are Jew or Gentile. You say, who are the Gentiles? Everybody that aren't Jews. Everybody that aren't Jews. When I was growing up, we used to sing in vacation Bible school and in Sunday school, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world, and he does. He builds bridges, not walls. And that was a pretty big bridge <laughs> between the Jews and the Gentiles. You can be a Jew, a Greek, a Filipino, Chinese, or Russian, and God still loves you. You may even be a Heinz 57 mixture like most of us probably are. God still loves you and provides his grace. A couple of years ago, Diane and I did a, for Christmas, we decided to give each other one of those 23 and me things. I wouldn't suggest you do that if you don't want to know everything. I really wouldn't. I'm still reaping the sorrow of that Christmas gift. I won't say what, but as little as a month ago, my brother sent me information on our family. He's dug even further, going back into the Mormon church play with all their uh, documents and everything else. And he sent me information about some of my family members. And uh, I said, just stop. Just stop. I don't want to know anymore. Doesn't matter. You may be Baskin Robbins 31 flavors or Heinz 57 as a part of your background and heritage. I am. I've got, let me, I'll just say this. I've got more Native American in me than Elizabeth Warren does. <laughs> tongue, tongue and cheek. Totally there. A, a lot more, I might say. This verse also speaks of national barriers. We're Americans and we're proud of it, but our primary identity is who we are in Christ. For instance, I am a 65-year-old, for a little while, white American male. I have far more in common with a 75-year-old Nigerian or Russian woman, grandmother, than I do with another who is a Christian, than I do with another 65-year-old American white male who is not. That's the way to try to describe it. That's the reality of the matter. Because our main source of identity comes from who we are in Christ. 
Then the text says Jesus bridges social division. Neither slave nor free. Now people read this passage and they don't really understand because when we think about slavery, all we think about is the antebellum South. And that's not what slavery was in the Roman Empire. Don't think about slaves in the South before the Civil War. In the Roman Empire, it was a common practice to bring the educated, skilled citizens of conquered nations, and most everybody around them were conquered nations, back to Rome to work for the Roman citizens. In fact, historians believe that about a third of the population were highly educated, highly skilled slaves in the Roman Empire. They couldn't own property, and they couldn't conduct business, but they were still sharp folk, talented folk. In almost every other social setting in the Roman Empire, these slaves and free citizens didn't mix openly. It was an economic wall separating them. It was a social wall separating them. It was an ethnic wall separating them until you got to the church of Jesus Christ. And there, there's neither slave nor free. Here, slaves and free citizens worshiped side by side. Wow. No economic walls, no economic distinctions. I, we don't have any parallels that I could think of that are even close to it. The closest parallel maybe we have today would be maybe when we go and do prison ministry. So you have people who are literally a slave in the prison and they don't have freedom. Or you might think on an economic sense, there might be some parallels. I mean, here in our church, we've got people who have lots of money and people who have no money. We have the Macy's crowd and the Neiman Marcus crowd right next to the Walmart crowd. We have the dollar store crowd right next to the Dillard's crowd. So, I mean, those are somewhat parallels, but there are places in the United States where you cannot go unless you are a member. You are not going to Augusta National unless you are a member, period. You are not going to the White House unless you have special clearance, period. You're not even going to the governor's mansion in Tallahassee unless you have special clearance, period. And I could go on and on with the places you cannot go where there are walls of separation, but in the church of Jesus Christ, he says there is neither Jew nor Greek. Male nor female, slave nor free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And then Jesus bridges gender divisions. He said there's neither male nor female. He didn't say there are any differences between males and females. <laughs> Not what he said. It says there's no difference in your standing in Christ between males and females. The Bible says God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them, and I don't care what anybody else says. In this culture, there is no scientific or biological evidence of anything other than what Genesis 1.27 says. Neither male nor female in the body of Christ either. Now, we're different emotionally. I mean, experiments and studies have shown that women, for instance, think with both sides of their brain, whereas men are almost all left-brained in their thinking. And the fact that every woman in here knows what I mean by that, and hardly any of the men in here have any clue what I mean by that, proves my point. I'm glad men and women are different. Aren't you? Somebody sent me one time a list of the ways that men and women think differently. He said, a man will pay $10 for a $5 item he needs. A woman will pay $5 for a $10 item she doesn't need because it's on sale. A man has an average of five items in his bathroom. 
And I can attest to you this is true of us. A toothbrush, a razor, a shaving cream, soap, and a comb. That's it. You should see my half of the bathroom. A woman has an average of 328 items in her bathroom, almost none of which a man can identify. That's true. When three men eat out and the bill is $44.95, each tosses a $20 bill on the table. When three women eat out and the bill is $44.95, out come the calculators. A woman knows everything about her children and everybody else's children. Their best friends, their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their dentist appointments. A man is vaguely aware that there are short people living in the house. That's true. When he says male and female were one in Christ, he's not saying there are not differences between us. You've probably seen the familiar saying a sociology professor in college was trying to prove that men and women are different. And he's, he asked them to, uh, he asked men and women to punctuate this sentence. Woman without her man is a savage. And the women almost all went, woman without her man is a savage. And the, the women all said, woman, without her, man is a savage. It depends on where you put the punctuation. It's true there are a lot of differences between us. There still are. If you go to an Orthodox Greek congregation right now, you will see that the men and the women are separated for worship. If you go in a Muslim synagogue, you will see that, or mosque, I should say, you will see them separated, men on one side, women on the other. The church in Galatia was trying to bring back that practice. They wanted the men on one side, the women on the other. But one of the beautiful things about the church is the ground at the foot of the cross is completely equal completely equal. There's neither male nor female, slave or free, Jew nor Greek. Now we often tend to just glide by, since verses 26, 27, 28 are so powerful, we often tend to glide by the next verse, and we shouldn't. It's important to the context. And now that you belong to Christ, and you're all one in Christ, you are the true children of Abraham, you are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. What is that promise? What belongs to us? Well, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 12. And you remember when we were doing the series back last fall on the, on the, and we were talking about the Adamic covenant uh, and then the Abrahamic covenant. Part, the major part of the Abrahamic covenant was, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Wow. That's our mission. Our mission when we're one in Christ and given these great promises is to not just take it and keep it for ourselves. Our mission is to be a blessing to others. Our mission is to bless everybody we possibly can because of the promise that we have been given. We must not forget our responsibility to be a blessing. I think of that. I often think about the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, two bodies of water in the Holy Land that are 87 miles apart, but millions of miles apart in practice. You see, the Sea of Galilee is fresh water, and it's teeming with fish and birds. The Dead Sea is dead. That's why it's called that. Nothing lives in it. What's the difference? The Sea of Galilee receives water and then shares its water. The Jordan River flows out of the Sea of Galilee and provides fresh water for thousands of acres of farmland. That water eventually flows in the Dead Sea, and then it just sits there. It has no outlet. It only receives. It never gives. The name in Hebrew means killer sea. Because if all you ever do is receive and don't give. 
That's what happens to you. People are the same way. We were never designed to be a Dead Sea person only receiving the promise, only receiving the blessings. He designed us to be Sea of Galilee people constantly giving because of the blessing that he has given to us. Wow. How remarkable. How revolutionary. Today, but especially so when it was written in the first century. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the difference Jesus makes. And it's unlike any other faith or religion in the whole world.